launch your medical career with zero to little debt with the Army's Health Professions Scholarship Program. HPSP is one of the most comprehensive scholarships available in the healthcare field. The Health Professions Scholarship could be great for those pursuing a career in one of these fields, medical, including osteopathy, dental, veterinary, nursing, counseling and clinical psychology, and optometry. For more information, visit GoArmy.com forward slash HPSP. Good morning and welcome back to the AMED Effect podcast, where we discuss the causes and effects of Army medicine opportunities, along with information and resources that are readily available for our military families or Army installations. I hope everyone enjoyed episode 10 that we had with Chaplain Kazovich. He is the chaplain at the Human Resources Command, and he provides care to both active duty and the retired community here at Fort Knox. But today, on episode 11, I have Lieutenant Colonel Mary Noel in the studio, and we are going to get to know a little bit about her background as a family medicine physician in the United States Army. Good morning. How are you doing today, ma'am? I'm fantastic. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty good, pretty good. Thank you. I know you have a busy schedule, so thank you for taking some time out, stop in, and um, speak with us today. So we are going to get right into the show. That way we don't hold you up too long. So um, I saw recently on the brigade's uh, Instagram and Twitter account that you recently visited the University of Louisville, um, and you spoke to the School of Medicine. Talk about your experience down there at the University of Louisville and being able to reach out and speak to some of those uh, students there. First of all, it was an honor to get a chance to speak with their military interest group. Uh-huh. They have a group at the School of Medicine in Louisville who have already committed to doing the Health Profession Scholarship Program okay. in the Army, Navy, and the Air Force. We mm-hmm. had representation from all of that. And so I was able to go and share my story during their lunch break. Okay. And they are very busy as well. <laughs> so they took some time to ask questions about what life is like after medical school, during residency, mm-hmm. what the military match process is, and what life is like as a physician in the Army. So that was that was an awesome time to get to speak with them. Man, good. That's good. I like lot of good information. I think we're going to talk about some of those things in this podcast episode too. So let's go ahead and get right into it. Um, Can you share a little bit uh, about your childhood and let the listeners know where you were from and how life was for you um, growing up? Absolutely. My time as a child was very enjoyable. My <laughs> parents, I, I am not an army brat, but okay. both of my parents served in the army. Okay. My dad retired when I was about five. So I did not get bounced around the United States like a lot of military brats mm-hmm. do. But my whole life, I remember my parents speaking positively about the army. My mom was a uh, AG officer and she also was a band officer. So she had a lot of unique experiences and okay. my dad had served for 20 years as an armor officer, and he had done ROTC at the University of Alabama. We were in Alabama for most of my life growing up. Okay. Um, And so I, we pretty much stayed put, (laughs) (laughs) even though I I kind of consider us a military family. Uh And my parents tell me that when I was around four or five years old, I walked in to where they were sitting, declared that I was going to be an army doctor. My brother, who's about 18 months younger than me, followed me and said, I could deliver babies during the day, and he would do it at night while I slept. So was would you say that there was anything when you were that young that inspired you to uh, or influence your decision to want to become um, a doctor in the Army? Well, Doc McStuffins is not a thing then. So, um, But I, I think the idea of caring for people resonated with me at a young age. I was a first child, so of course you've got that aspect with it mm-hmm. too. But uh, from... Medicine seemed to capture my attention from the time I really don't even remember my parents tell that story. Right. Okay. So, yeah, you got that. You you really picked up on that at an early age. Um, I think a lot of people, I think when we spoke with the brigade commander, she said the same thing at an early age. She knew what she was going to do. So she walked in and she kind of did the same thing, said the same thing to her parents. So 
um, definitely uh, a good choice uh, to take up. So congratulations on that. Now, um, did you have any family influences on your career? Um, and was there any specific family members who inspired you later on after you said you wanted to become a doctor in the Army? Well, the Army part was added on later. Okay. So I did not know I wanted to be an Army physician until I started looking at what I was going to do before going to medical school, which is undergrad. Uh-huh. Like I said, my family had served in the Army and spoke very positively about it. I had a cousin who had attended the Air Force Academy, and that introduced my perspective on what opportunities were available through the service academies. And that's what got me looking into going to potentially the service academies. And when I found out that I could attend the United States Military Academy, Mm -hmm. stay Army, not Air Force, (laughs) um, they had shared that they actually allot 2% of their class to go to medical school. That was good enough odds for me. (laughs) I want to say I was pretty driven. And so I, I, at that time when I was visiting West Point in the, in my junior year, the fall of my junior year, I realized that that calling to be an army physician was something very special and Mm -hmm. it resonated with me just like being a physician had resonated with me. And so I set my sights on becoming an army physician as a junior in high school. But I would say that my cousin attending the Air Force Academy and becoming an, uh, a pilot in the Air Force certainly was inspiring because he had dedicated his life from the time he started you know, at 18, mm-hmm. and uh, as my dad had done ROTC as well. So okay. those are definitely inspiring family members that I had. Okay. Now, in 2008, you spoke, well, before we get there, now, you spoke about attending um, the United States Military Academy. Um, so in 2008, you completed um, your time there, and you earned your Bachelor of Science, and then you commissioned into uh, you commissioned into the U.S. Army. Um, what was your educational experience like growing up, um, uh, growing up in high school? And can you share your personal journey that led you to the uh, United States Military Academy? Sure. So I stayed involved in a lot of different things Mm -hmm. from a pretty young age. So I enjoyed doing sports. I enjoyed being part of the math team, which is, you know, super awesome, right? You get on a bus to go take a math test on a Saturday, but you got to the mall. (laughs) So that's, that's really, that was a a motivating factor as a Uh middle schooler. Um, (laughs) And so I stayed involved in academic clubs as well as I was in band and I played basketball and golf. And so I I just stayed busy all the time. Uh And I think that helps build your resume when you're looking at going to something like a service academy or getting a scholarship. Um, And that, uh, that I think made me well-rounded and certainly the, the physical fitness gained from being in sports prepared me to go to West Point because you definitely have to be fit to go. And that's not something you try to get after you're there. So get physically fit after you're there. <laughs> now, when you first landed at West Point, um, do you remember or can you describe what your first day was like? And what was your initial impressions? You won't believe this. I got left in a hallway with one of my classmates during that first day. So oh, our man. day is tons of chaos. You say goodbye to your parents, then they ship you off on a bus. And what I remember is that I, we literally got left in a whole way, which with all the chaos going on and then being involved with it when I was a, uh, a cadet leader, I can see how that happened. But mm-hmm. we actually got rushed through eating lunch. And so we didn't get yelled at a lot right. when they caught found us. <laughs> so I kind of got rushed through the end. Um, but I just remember it being a blur. I remember the bag being very heavy and mm-hmm. it was very hard to stuff all the things that they were giving you into the bag. But it was the start of a great adventure. And that's how I viewed that first summer called Beast Barracks is that it was just a lot of things you didn't expect you <laughs> to ever do, including right. the gas chamber oh, and, man. you know, doing land navigation and, you know, sitting out in the rain, waiting for the night range fires to start. So that was, you know, I look upon it fondly. At the time, I think I was not as happy. <laughs> <laughs> now, speaking of West Point, um, some of our greatest leaders um, are among more than the 80,000 graduates of the academy, um, and they have went on to serve in fields of medicine, law, business, politics, and science following their Army career. Um, how did your time at the academy shape your leadership skills and personal development? One of my squad leaders, so that was a junior when I was a freshman, Uh I remember telling me that when you come into West Point, you come in with your glass mostly full Mm -hmm. and then the academy fills it up, or you come in with your glass kind of empty and then the academy fills it up. (laughs) 
I think I came in with half and half. Okay. I think the Academy certainly gave me experiences that I wouldn't have had otherwise, opportunities to lead and opportunities to make mistakes because you are only 21 years right. old when mm -hmm. you're put in charge as a cadet first sergeant or mm -hmm. um, a cadet leader. And so I think it provided me the space to explore my leadership styles and make some mistakes that I got <laughs> opportunities to reflect on later, you right. know, as your brain continues to mature into your 20s. Um, so, but I, I think it gave me um, certainly a lot of connections with other fantastic leaders mm -hmm. who have gone on to serve and are, are currently serving or have gotten out and got involved in the business realm or political realm. Um, I'm very blessed to have had the influences of my peers and the people who were there teaching and mentoring cadets at the time. So I think it definitely showed me the importance of connection with the people around you and building right. your community to get through because it's certainly a, a team sport to make it through West Point. <laughs> definitely. Now, speaking of that, we spoke with uh, Colonel Walters, and she uh, told us about how one of her classmates uh, went on to be real big in NASA. And they had we had just recently saw a story about him. So it goes to say about the connections that you have in those individuals who are coming through West Point. So let's give a round of applause to those individuals who have went through West Point, went through all of the training, and made it out and went on to do amazing things. <laughs> balance academics, military training, and your personal life during your time at West Point? I know there's a lot that's going on, so how, how do you have that balance there? Well, as a mom of six, mm -hmm. I now say that there's no such thing as balance. <laughs> I think it goes along the lines of work-life integration, and even at the academy, you had to figure that out. Mm -hmm. And the academy gave me some opportunities to make some mistakes. Maybe I was a little too social at times and needed to so focus more on my academics, but I, say, I think that um, keeping my focus on my goal of going to medical school certainly helped. Um, knowing what you're there for, knowing what you're there to do, uh -huh. um, knowing that it, it wasn't a guarantee that I would get to go to medical school certainly helped me focus my attention on my studies. Um, I had the opportunity to row with the crew team my first two years there, and that was, that was an awesome group of ladies that I rowed with, and that certainly instilled some discipline because – to wake up really early, go row on the Hudson River. It could, it was usually cold. Ooh, it sounds cold. <laughs> and <laughs> then and then go to classes all day. Um, now I will tell you that I did not make it consciously through all the classes <laughs> every single day, <laughs> right. but um, but certainly instilled some discipline in me to prepare for future challenges like being awake for twenty four hours on mm -hmm. a on a shift. Right. Um, and so so it kind of started some of those ideas that like I'm going to be in uncomfortable situations and I better get used to it. Right. Yeah. Definitely. A lot of uncomfortable situations. Uh, so yeah, being able to adapt to that. I, I know that it was probably something that you had to get used to, but it seems like you made it through. Um, now, what do you believe sets the United States Military Academy apart from other institutions that medical professionals go to? I mean, it looks like Hogwarts. So that, that helps. <laughs> Harry Potter was coming out while I was a cadet, and uh, they actually, there would be parents sending parts of the book mm -hmm. over the summer training where, like, you're not allowed to have personal reading material. Oh, wow. Okay. And this is just a quick story. I remember <laughs> some of my classmates who were in charge found out that there were parts of the Harry Potter book being circulated around and they made the cadet, the new cadets carry around sticks that like wands and cast spells on each other. <laughs> <laughs> kind of ridiculous. I mean, I don't know, like, like who's going to have that kind of experience when they were college right. students. So um, certainly uh, it's, it's a, it's a pretty select group of people who are there. So as I mentioned before, you are surrounded by some people who've done some amazing things in their communities and are go on going to be leaders in the future so, so those relationships that I've built are probably some of the closest relationships I've had in my life and still stay very close with uh, some of my friends who were there. So I think that that sets it apart, like the depth of your connection, because you're literally all living together. Right. Like you're in barracks, not dorms, mm -hmm. and you don't have like a microwave and a fridge and all this stuff. And 
a private sitting area. No, okay. <laughs> you have to clear out every semester all your stuff yeah. and put it in a locker room and then bring it back. And you don't cho- choose your roommate always. And so it's it's just a unique experience where you're very close to people. You're going through physically challenging times when you're doing the military training or the or the you know the sports that everybody does. So everybody does the sport there, no matter if you want to or not. Um, and the relationships that you build with the people who are there to teach you and coach you are also tremendously valuable. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, th- I think those are some of the the differences that set, set it apart from other schools. Now you talked about doing sports as you were as you were growing up, and then you said that everybody played a sport at the academy as well. Uh, what sport did you play? So I rode on the crew team. Okay. So for the first two years, and then I was actually had the opportunity to exchange to the Naval Academy for a semester. So uh-huh. it's like a foreign exchange just to another service academy. And so I rode with the Navy's team, believe it or not, even though there are enemy. <laughs> <laughs> I, that was actually a fantastic experience being in Annapolis for a semester, and still have very close connections with some of the people I met there. But um, and then I um, I also participated in. Oh, gosh, I think we did orienteering. Do you know what that is? No, I'm not familiar like with that. like land nav sport, basically. Okay. <laughs> so you're going to run around and find points. Um, I did some ultimate Frisbee, which carried on to medical school and then even into residency. Okay. Um, so, um, so if you weren't doing a formal club or um, NCAA Division One sport, then uh-huh. you would do these kind of these intramural sports every semester. Okay. Now, you spoke about residency training. Well, you just brought that up uh, here when, when, you, when we were just speaking. Now, in 2012, you received your Doctor of Medicine from um, the Uniform Service University, and then you went on to do residency training at Martin Army Hospital, which is uh, Fort Moore, Georgia. Mm-hmm. Um, talk about your experience at residency training and how it helped mold you into the physician that you are today. I started residency training on July 1st, mm-hmm. 2012, on labor and delivery. Oh, man. So if you want to talk about <laughs> diving in from the very beginning. And, and I really, I pursued family medicine because I love the opportunity to be involved in women's health and mm-hmm. that very critical time of life where women are having babies both as their pregnancy develops and then, you know, after they have the baby. And so that had drawn me to family medicine to begin with. And the fact that I could care for the patient in the whole spectrum of life mm-hmm. brought me from ob Joanne to the family medicine side uh, when I was a third-year medical student. Okay. Well, just a, a, a side note, I was born at Martin Army. So. Oh, you were? <laughs> yeah. At the was, White Castle on the Hill? At the White Castle on the Hill. Did you know hill. they're demolishing it? Are they? Yeah. Man, kind of so like sad. they did Ireland. Yeah. Man. I, I, oh, man. I, I went, to, I trained at the old, we called it the old hospital. And uh-huh. then in my third year of residency, we actually moved into the new hospital, which okay. is gorgeous. So and I had my, I had my first child at the old hospital, second child at the new hospital uh, <laughs> while I was in pretty much while I was in residency. I had my daughter while I was in a second year of residency. And then uh-huh. right after I finished residency, I had my third, my second child. So, um, so very also connected to the, the halls of the old hospital and very sad to see it go. Yeah. So, yeah. I'm all, and then on top of that, my parents are still there. So they're still working oh. on base. So when I go visit, I do see the hospital. So it'll be yeah. crazy to see that go. Now, I'm going to talk yeah. to my mother about that yeah. when I speak to her later on, ask her if she knows yeah. that they're tearing that down. Um, AMED, we offer residency trainings um, in, in locations all across uh, the country and the world. Um, was Martin Army Hospital your top choice of residency training? It was, okay. but it was because of a boy. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I, m- my husband was also a West Point graduate. Uh-huh. He was a few years behind me. I did, we did not date when he was a freshman and I was a senior. Okay. I promise we did not. There's <laughs> rules. We were rule followers. But um, my husband and I got married before my fourth year of medical school, uh-huh. and he branched infantry and got stationed there. So it worked out really well that I wanted to do family medicine. And mm-hmm. I tell people that I think I would have chosen Martin Army Community Hospital because it was an unopposed residency training program, meaning that we had no other residencies there to compete against for experiences. Okay. And so we ran labor and delivery. We ran our inpatient medicine ward. And that was so cool to have that autonomy. I mean, as an intern, we were working nights on labor and delivery with a staff OB. And so the autonomy that you got to practice in, I thought was mm-hmm. um, was very compelling. And so I really enjoyed that experience and I even chose to go back there to teach after I finished um, some more of my training. So. Okay. Now, uh, I said that there's multiple locations. If you know about any, what are some of some of the other unique residency locations that uh, we are that we provide? Uh, to, to those students that are that may be considering a career in the Army? 
Well, a lot of people don't know that there is a huge military hospital on Oahu in mm. Hawaii. Okay. So Triple Army Medical Center is out there. Um, I was stationed at Joint Base Lewis McCord at Madigan Army Medical Center, which uh -huh. is a little south of Seattle. Okay. There's a large military medical facility in San Antonio. We have a training program in Walter Reed, Fort Liberty, which was Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Um, on the other side of Georgia, where I was from, uh, Eisenhower Army Medical Center near Augusta. Uh -huh. okay. And um, I think that covers some of them. So th those are those are the major, major ones, ones that we had that we do training at. Okay, yeah, we do a, uh, well, we did, uh, well, a couple of years ago, we did a, a tour, ed tour, to what, what was in the ed tour, but it was our uh, Army Medicine experience. We went down to uh, San Antonio mm -hmm. and we was a, we were able to go visit BAMC. So that was a cool experience as well, being able to go into the hospital and see everything that they had there. Mm -hmm. So real nice. Now, um, in 2016, you were awarded the degree of fellow. Uh, was it a degree of fellowship or is it a degree of fellow by American a Academy of Physicians? So yeah, it's the degree of fellow from the American okay. Academy of Family Physicians. And so that's our, our governing body, our home as a family medicine physician in the United States. And so you have to do a certain number of things in your experience to be able to qualify for the degree of fellow. And so that was conferred as I was starting my faculty development fellowship, two separate things. Um, okay. But uh, I was I was starting fellowship at Madigan Army Medical Center when I when I had the opportunity to receive that. Okay. Now let's talk about some of the, the key roles and responsibilities of a uh, family medicine physician. Um, talk about um, a family medicine physician's daily task and responsibilities. It really depends on where you're stationed and what role you're playing. Because a family medicine physician at its core is cradle to grave medicine, mm -hmm. right? So you are taking care of babies as soon as they come out of their mamas and you're <laughs> taking care of people right before their lives end. Okay. And which is, which is a privilege to be able mm -hmm. to walk into any area of someone's life and be able to speak to it. We're very broad. We're not necessarily super deep, but uh, one of the challenges of being a family physician is to know the limits of what you're able to do and then get that person to the right resources to continue their health care. And I think it, it takes a lot of training. It takes a lot of intentionality to be excellent as mm -hmm. a family physician because there's so much out there and things are changing rapidly. So um, in, as an Army family physician, it can also look like a lot of different things. So mm -hmm. you can be anywhere from taking care of helicopter pilots as a flight surgeon. And when I say surgeon, I don't mean they're doing operations. Right. It's just the generic term the Army uses for doctor. So <laughs> you can be a flight surgeon. You could be working at a clinic, seeing patients. You could be um, in a deployed setting, um, taking care. I mean, I was deployed as an ER doctor. Like right. I was deployed in, in the emergency treatment mm -hmm. tent in Iraq because there just weren't enough emergency medicine physicians around. And so you could fill roles that you wouldn't necessarily expect to fill right. as an Army family physician. But um, I, I served on faculty, and so I got to participate in teaching residents procedures and how to become a family doc while also still taking care of my patients, which was, which was really neat. Would you say that um, being able to fill those various roles are the difference between um, Army and civilian practice? I'll say in civilian practice, it's a lot harder to stay full scope because there's that aspect of malpractice insurance. And right. depending on where you are in the country, they may not let family physicians be as involved. Um, and, and again, that varies depending on where you are located. But I think if you want to do full scope family medicine, the Army is a great place to do that. The military in general allows you to, mm -hmm. if you want to stay involved in obstetric care and inpatient medicine, if you want to do a fellowship in sports medicine or in obstetrics, if you want to... Um, do something in the operational medicine community where you can deploy with ranger, rangers and special special forces operators. Um, th there's a space for kind of everybody in family medicine, in my opinion. Okay. Now, do you face or do family uh, medicine physicians face um, unique challenges when providing care to military families? Absolutely. I mean, a lot of the family members that I took care of were typically – um, dependents, so spouses of drill sergeants, uh -huh. people who have jobs that if you don't know what they do, uh -huh. you just don't have a context. So when you have a, a spouse come in who has four children, all under the age of six, and their husband's a drill sergeant, you're like, oh, they're home. They're not home. They are working their tails off at various hours, and it's almost like they are not 
physically home. They'll right. come home for short stints of time. That creates a lot of challenges for families, especially when they're trying to navigate their own health problems. And so I, what I found is that a lot of the spouses were giving and giving and giving to their families, you know, in absence of having their their military spouse home. Uh -huh. And and that made it challenging for them because they would develop health conditions, you know, a lot of, and well, in the behavioral health world, but also just physical conditions that they hadn't had time to take care of. So I think we forget how much stress and burden they carry as they try to maintain and manage their household. A lot of them will have a profession or occupation mm -hmm. as well. And, uh, and their spouses will potentially not be home a lot of the time. Right. Yeah, I can remember that. My dad was our armor, so time in the field. And then time to, with PCS, going to Germany those months of ahead. My mom staying back because she's in college. So she's like, I'm trying to finish this up. So I can understand being away and not being there. But so it's definitely something that we that we see uh, all the time as a military brat. But um. I think I've turned out pretty good, so <laughs> me and my sister did pretty good, so Love that's it. cool. Yeah. Uh, I'm not I'm not upset with it. Um, now, being in any field, you want uh, there's opportunities for professional development. What opportunities exist um, for advancement as a family army family medicine um, physician for those that are in the army? So the army kind of forces you to continue <laughs> to do professional development. I mean, if you want to continue to get promoted, uh -huh. you will attend professional military education, which I had an opportunity to go when I was in residency because the job I was going to after residency as a brigade surgeon required that I have captain's career course. And okay. so those are professional military education experiences where they are giving you a broader scope of what is out there for the army and allows you to speak that language better. And there's leader development woven throughout all of those different courses. And so from the captain's career course, there's an intermediate level education or the command and general staff college, war college. So the army actually has its own built-in program to make sure you're developing as a leader. But I think um, there's also a lot of informal opportunities. So you sometimes are put into leadership positions mm -hmm. <laughs> whether you think you're ready or not. <laughs> right. And there there are a lot of opportunities in that to experience what it means to run a clinic, run a, run a department, run a hospital. And so the Army um, puts you in positions, I think, younger than you would as a civilian to take risks uh -huh. and to take opportunities of you know, getting to be the change maker. Oh, right. um, and, and sometimes that can get a little frustrating because you can make as much change as you want at your level and then the level above you shuts it down. That's also part of growing and developing and learning where your limits are. Okay. Well, you guys, we're going to take a quick break, and we're going to pay a couple of bills, and we're going to uh, let you listen to this commercial about the AMED department, and we'll be right back. Are you looking to pursue a successful healthcare career at one of the largest and most advanced medical facilities in the country? If so, look no further. The U.S. Army is here. Visit GoArmy.com forward slash AMED to learn how you can serve soldiers, their families, military retirees, and at times, the general public while providing meaningful service. If you guys would like to learn more about the Army Medical Department, make sure that you follow that link. That is goarmy.com forward slash AMED. Now, back to episode 11. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Noel, you currently are the Brigade Recruiting Integration Officer. Talk about um, what that position entails um, and its significance in, rec in the recruitment process. Absolutely. Well, I've been in this job for all of two and a two and a half months. Okay. So I'm an expert now. <laughs> not, I'm not an expert. So, um, but it has been fast paced uh -huh. and the, the role of the medical recruiting integration officer is really a critical role to connect the people thinking about joining the army and pursuing a profession as a physician in the army, mm -hmm. um, with someone who's done it. So, so I, I serve the role of helping the recruiters by giving those students, my experience and in answering some questions about the military match, about residency programs in the Army. Mm -hmm. And I also get the opportunity to network at different national conferences to get to meet the leadership of the different organizations that, you know, host the 
um, American College of Surgeons, American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. So that that role allows us to have a, a seat at the table, if you will, for military medicine, mm-hmm. for us to have a presence at those conferences and to be uh, give exposure to the national public that we exist. Okay. And one of the things I really enjoy is working with the recruiters because that is a hard job. It is very challenging to be plucked out of whatever job you're doing in the army. And then all of a sudden you're recruiting physicians. That's, Mm -hmm. that's challenging. So I, one of my, one of my greatest joys in this job is getting to work with the recruiters to teach them what makes an army doctor, what's kind of the personality types of people who pursue medicine. Um, If you look at the evidence, it says that we're a little neurotic. Uh (laughs) (laughs) We're a little type A and we're very detail oriented. And so, um, but those are, that's a different population of people recruiting compared to um, the, the other side of army recruiting where, you know, they're recruiting kids out of high school. Uh So it's been, uh, it's been a, a joy to get to learn about the recruiters challenges and help them as they're, as they're looking to bring excellent family, you know, not family physicians, all of, obviously I want them all to be family physicians, but <laughs> excellent physicians in the army, whether they are coming in through the health profession scholarship program, or if they're a direct commission, mm-hmm. so they're already a board certified physician, and now they're willing to sacrifice their civilian life, you know, what they were experiencing for to, to sign up for something greater than themselves. Now, I know you probably didn't have the opportunity to experience this while you were at the academy, but um, how do you feel when you have the opportunity to go back and speak to those college students and tell them about the opportunities um, and the experiences that are available through the U.S. Army? Well, or did I, you have that experience? Did somebody work? Did people come out to the academy and talk to you all as well? They did. Okay. I remember a HPSB student from okay. Tulane coming out and speaking to us, and um, and I remember hearing about. That I was going to take the HPSP scholarship if I didn't go to the Uniformed Services University. So I certainly worked with the recruiter and our health mm-hmm. advisor at West Point. But now, you know, I've probably spoken to them in the two short months I've been here, probably about 100 students who okay. are thinking about the HPSP scholarship. I spend a lot of my weeks speaking to pre-medical students about what it's like um, on the Army medicine side. And it's been so fun to hear about their own personal experiences that have taken to the point where they're thinking about joining. And, mm-hmm. um, and, 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 you know, they're sometimes they're very real conversations because I am not a recruiter, right? Like I, I am here to help the recruiters, right. but, um, I'm able to answer their questions really directly. I don't sugarcoat things. <laughs> you know, I don't, we don't have time for that, right? Like right. you need to know what you're getting into. And, and there are certain risks you take mm-hmm. as a, as choosing army medicine, right. but I think there's also a ton of benefits. And so I try to try to highlight both of those things and, and answer the questions as best I can for those students. Now, what are some common, common challenges that the army is facing in that they have faced when trying to streamline the recruitment process? Um, and how do you address these issues? I think it's really important to set expectations for the students of how long sometimes the paperwork takes mm-hmm. because there oh, are, yeah. I like to use the term <laughs> echelons above reality. Like there are just like very high levels that some of these packets have to go to depending on what the applicant needs. Uh-huh. And so we try to set the stage that it's, it's not a one and done deal. <laughs> there's, there's multiple engagements right. with the recruiter. There's sometimes additional forms that need to be filled out. Um, but if, if you get involved early enough in the process, you usually don't, you know, hit too many road bumps. And then if there's someone who's involved late in the process, I mean, I worked with a student recently who just signed Friday, right? We're trying to get them, get them on and getting their stipend as soon as possible so that they can receive the benefits of the scholarship. Um, But, you know, people come to Army Medicine in a lot of different stages of their life. So we're here to help them through all of that. The the paperwork part is usually challenging. The paperwork, yeah, always. Now, um, you you, you you talked about the uh, Health Profession Scholarship Program. Can you provide our listeners with the overview of the HPSP program and its primary goals? Absolutely. So the Army Medicine raises its own. And so you have an opportunity to be in the Army from the beginning, from when you start in medical school. So the Health Profession Scholarship Program is a uh, up to four-year tuition free experience at your medical school. So the Army will pay no matter what medical school you go to in the United States um, that's accredited. Um, That school is paid for along with most of the fees that come along with that. There are some certain nuances, like if Mm -hmm. it's a, they won't buy a laptop for you, but they'll pay a rental fee. You know, they, if your, if your school has some type of association fee that's related to social events, they don't cover that. But, but most of the things are covered Mm -hmm. by the Army. 
You also had the opportunity to assign a $20,000 accession bonus. And that bonus, um, we're, at, we're working really hard to increase that because it's been $20,000 for lots of years. So All if right. you have a congressperson who's involved in the next <laughs> NDAA, um, let them know that we're not giving our students enough, I think, to, to really incentivize it. But you get a $20,000 signing bonus. And that comes in the first few months of, of receiving the scholarship. Okay. And so you also get a stipend to, to kind of take care of additional fees, things like that. Right now it's twenty two thousand eight hundred and seventy dollars that changes each July, increases by a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then um, 45 days out of each year, you are paid as a second lieutenant, which is a little bit more. And you will use that time, those 45 days each year, to either do a military medicine experience, like working at a military hospital, uh -huh. maybe doing a, a rotation audition for preparing for the military match, uh -huh. or you are going to do the direct commission course and basic officer leadership course. It's a six week stint of training, usually between their first and second year of medical school, where they get exposed to what the army is like, how to wear a uniform, how to march, what it means to, to be a army officer mm -hmm. and an army medical officer. Um, and, and that really, um, that really kind of encompasses that four years is you have that six week experience and then you're going to be at military hospitals rotating and looking at, you know, where you want to do your specialty of choice. Um, and then in exchange, right? Because I tell people if the army pays for an experience, they're going to ask for time, right? They're not going to ask for money back. They're <laughs> going to ask for time. I am, I am a poster child of that, <laughs> receiving all my degrees through the military, but I, uh, I think it's important to know. So there's there's four years that you serve as uh, active duty uh -huh. after your residency. Okay. There's some nuances associated with that. If you have a longer residency than four years, sometimes it adds a little bit more time, mm -hmm. and you'll you'll pay back that four years on active duty, um, and and that that's the scholarship. Yeah, that's the scholarship there now. Um, so they they're there for four years. Can after they after they complete the four years, can they extend their time out a little bit longer or are they required to, uh, or, or, or can they get out and just be done with the Army altogether? They can be done with the Army altogether, comma. They're in the inactive reserve, which basically means they're on a roster. Okay. So if something really, really horrible happens, there has not been any physicians recalled for the last, like, 20-plus years. So, okay. um, so, so there is a, the, the, the four years of active, and then you're on the inactive reserve for four years. If you choose to stay or if you find an opportunity to apply for a fellowship and you might incur a little bit more time, there's certainly opportunities. We, we aren't cooking kicking anybody out right <laughs> understood you, de you guys definitely can stay in as long well not as long as you want but for a little bit longer yeah. um now you talked about matching and um match day how important is match day for students um and do students always get to match with the uh with the residency of their choice? That's a great question. I think I address this with probably 90 percent of the students I talk to again uh -huh. the recruiters know a lot but it is a huge, its own other ex, you know, field where you need to be a subject matter expert. I've right. been in graduate medical education working with residents for the last eight years. So uh -huh. I consider myself pretty knowledgeable about it. And when I hit the limits of my knowledge as a family doc, I go to the resources and get the answer for the student. But so for the military match, it's completely separate from the civilian match. And it is the Army match. So the Army, Navy, and Air Force all have their own HPSP programs. Okay. The Army match is a little under 400 people, you know, in the last few years. And one of the impressive statistics is that 85% of that cohort gets their specialty of choice. And the civilian side, it's a little less than 50% for both MD and DO in the civilian match. Uh -huh. the, the, military, the Army match happens... Um, much sooner than the civilian match the match occurs. The civilian match occurs in March, and you find out where you're going in December for the Army. So that gives you a little bit more time to prepare. The specialty um, specialty competitiveness varies depending on what you're looking at. Emergency medicine and orthopedic surgery are probably the more competitive residency programs that we have. But the um, but the, like in the primary care realm, there's pretty high chance you'd match into primary care. Okay. Um, and so um, I have all those statistics and I'll share them with the students when I talk to them, especially uh -huh. if they're interested in a sp specific specialty. But the Army offers a whole lot of specialties. I mean, it's pretty much everything. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I have a list of fellowships and residency programs that are offered in the Army that I share with students regularly. Now, um, what advice do you give out to those medical professionals who are considering um, a career in military medicine? I know you talked about uh, just 
being straightforward, letting them know what they are getting themselves into. But is there are there any other type of gems that you give them as well? Um, I tell them to be competitive for the HPSB scholarship. Mm-hmm. They need to be competitive to get into medical school medical school and do as well as they possibly can in medical school. Right. So if they're thinking about pursuing HPSB, they really should be focusing on getting as, as good of an MCAT score as they can, keeping their GPA high, pursuing the opportunities that are going to make them competitive for medical school. And then the HPSB part right, is going to come alongside as they're doing, I usually recommend as they're doing their secondary applications for medical school, that that's kind of as they're looking. Um, and that's, you know, August, September timeframe before they're going to matriculate. Some people come to it later, which is totally fine. We can work with anybody kind of at any stage. Okay. And, and even if you're hearing this and you were not um, knowledgeable of the program, you're already in medical school. We have other opportunities for three, two, and one year scholarships as well. So, so all those opportunities exist. I tell people to get fit. I mean, it's, it's important <laughs> to be fit, milit- you know, physically, because one, we all know that that's better for your mental health. Right. Yes. Very it's, right. it's important for your longevity. Mm-hmm. It's important for um, when you join the army, it's really challenging to try to get more fit as you're doing the, you know, you're in the rigors of medical school and residency. So um, I think learning, you know, what, what your strengths and you know weaknesses are and, and being able to make sure you can mitigate those as much as possible, mitigate your weaknesses as much as possible is, is really important as you prepare. Now, we have a lot of different um, social media platforms that are out there, your Twitters, your Instagram, so on and so forth. I um, mean, there's people who is always putting out information. What misconceptions do people often have about military medicine that you would like to address? There's some some interesting, funny ones. I'll address one of the more common ones. I actually spoke to a student today about this. Is uh-huh. They said, am I going to be forced to match into what the Army needs? Mm-hmm. And so that that's not true, right? There's going to be a certain number of slots for each mm-hmm. residency training program based on the specialty, right? We, we are going to have more orthopedic surgeons than neurosurgeon slots in the Army. But it's it's important to know that the military match is designed like the civilian match in the sense that you get to put your specialty of choice – and then you get an opportunity to, to put a second se- specialty of choice or a transitional year um, opportunity that's an internship. It's like if you don't match into emergency medicine, you could do a, uh, an intern year, get an opportunity to apply again for the match. That's one of the misconceptions. And then I spoke to someone who, who thought that they were going to be restricted to living on post, on base. Mm-hmm. And I, that's not true. The Army doesn't force you to choose, like force you to live on post. You can rent someplace or buy, uh, you know, off post. That's totally fine. So, um, there's, there's also some misconceptions about just like what life looks like as a medical student. Like you're there to go to medical school. That's your job. Like Uh other than the six weeks I talked about that, you're going to be doing military training. Everything else is going to be revolved around you becoming as good of a doctor as you can become. Okay. How has your understanding since you've been in the service evolved from your childhood, um, to your current role as a physician? So when you think about the army and you're outside of the army, mm-hmm. all you know is what's put in front of you, which is usually movies. Right. right. <laughs> Saving Private Ryan, yes. some of those other things. So uh, I think what you don't see is all the work that goes behind making an organization like the army run, all the different people involved. And so one of the things I love about the army is it's a huge team. And, you know, being a physician is really about being part of a team. Mm-hmm. And, and I really experienced that when I worked at Martin Army Community Hospital that takes everybody to take care of that patient. And as you grow in your ranks and in leadership, you get to see some of the intricacies involved in how do we care for a patient? Because you think it's like you as a doctor, when you're a baby doctor, (laughs) you think I walk in and I treat the patient, I prescribe them the medication and that's it. It's a huge system that goes from everybody, everybody, is involved who walks in that door to take care of patients and it's everybody from our our nursing our nursing staff our administrators the people greeting people at the front desk and directing them to the right place to go the pharmacy the lab the people who clean the building like that's super super important to create a healthy a safe environment oh, yeah. for our patients and so i think and then you know the army is a is a bigger setting of like what healthcare is right like it takes everybody to run these large organizations in order to defend our nation's freedom and to and to accomplish the the various missions that are given to us. Okay. Um, if you could speak about this, um, what innovations or changes 
and military medicine are you most excited for in the near future? I think it's going to be really important that we extend our reach as far as we can into the depth of the, of the battlefield, and technology is going to help us with that. And so it's going to be really, you know, we only have so many surgeons mm -hmm. in the Army, right. and they can't be everywhere. And they can't be in the dangers in the danger danger zones because we need them. We need their skill set. It takes a long time to grow a surgeon, and so we are going to have opportunities to get the eyes of the surgeon, maybe even the hands, like the knowledge of a surgeon, to to the farthest extent of the battlefield. And that that is that's been in process. But I think we you know you think about just robotics, right? Like robotic surgeries yeah. that are happening that are coming to Army medical facilities and defense and the Defense Health Agency. Um, the, there's a lot of things that technology is going to allow us to do to extend our reach as physicians. Yes. Uh, I, it's funny that you say that. So I went to the last two times that I've been out to Global Medic. That's been kind of something that they have been speaking about. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's, it's interesting hearing you say that as well. So yeah. definitely. Um, finally, what message do you um, would you like to convey to listeners about the importance of healthcare care um, in, in the military? military community. In order to defend our nation, we have to have people taking care of the people <laughs> defending our nation. And so it's it's critical. And the army has recently done analysis and we don't have enough physicians. Mm -hmm. We don't. That's why our mission to bring in HBSB scholarship recipients is increasing this year by 25 um, to 340. And so I don't know if that's been officially published, but <laughs> it will be soon. <laughs> so it's it's really important to know that, you know, in order to keep an army unit healthy and safe, you have to have healthcare providers mm -hmm. to do that. And and you need physicians who are board certified and who understand the breadth of the culture of the army as well as everything else that's happening in medicine. Right. So having really well trained, proficient physicians who are also who are army officers right we're army officers and we're military physicians mm -hmm. i think the army officer part is something people forget exists <laughs> you know when they're looking at it but that officership is extremely important and yeah. it, it embodies a lot of what the physician profession embodies as well right, right. integrity um being able to think about others more than yourself you know, being able to to know how to take risk the best way because uh -huh. you're going to take risk right. regardless. And so th those are some of the things that I want people to think about is that you have to have Army physicians, you have to have Navy and Air Force physicians as, as we're looking at what the risks are to our nation, uh, you know, as we look forward into the future. Right. Yeah, and that was one, another thing from Global Medic that was that was pretty cool to see is all of the joint forces coming together and practicing and sharing ideas. This is how we do this over here in the Navy. This is how we do this in the Army and so on and so forth. So it was cool being able to experience and hear them talk about that as well. Right. We're going to, I mean, medicine is purple mm -hmm. for the most part. <laughs> the Army and Navy and Air Force have their have their nuances, but, but you know, having a, a bulk of great fully trained physicians and all the different specialties is going to be very important to yeah. future conflict. Definitely. Now, um, when the day is over and the uniform comes off and you're at home with family, what hobbies um, uh, interest you outside of serving the country, outside of, uh, outside of serving the country? I have six children, mm -hmm. so they are my hobby. Okay. <laughs> Keep you busy, huh? Yeah, so I've got an 11-year-old and under. We ended with twin two-year-old girls. So mm -hmm. it is it is busy in our house. We love soccer, so we play soccer. My husband coaches soccer, and we go to soccer games. Um, and so that, that we're a big fan of the Columbus Crew. So that that's been some of our time is spent doing that. And okay. then um, yeah, and then I you know I'm I'm working with my daughter on learning how to run, and we we like to stay physically active, mm -hmm. swim and um, play. And you know, there's definitely some screen time though. There has to be screen time. Of <laughs> For we sure. won't survive otherwise. For sure. So you said soccer, right? Yes. Uh, any Louisville FC games? We're gonna go. We're okay. going this month, actually. On okay. my on my my six year old's about to turn seven. We're going on his birthday to go see Lou, Lou City. So we're really excited about that. Okay, sounds good. Now, uh, before you get out of here, is there anything else that you would like to leave our listeners about you, your practice as a family medicine physician, or your role as the Rio at the brigade? I think the Rio is going to be one of the best jobs I ever do. Okay. I was an associate program director for a residency program, and, mm -hmm. and that was 
a tremendous opportunity and I loved working with residents. I'm really enjoying working with recruiters and future residents who are going to be in all specialties. And so that's, that's been really awesome to step into this role and to see how I, how I can help and be part of the team as we work towards this mission of, of providing future professionals for the army. Okay. Well, thank you for spending some time with us here at the AMED Effect. Hopefully, we did not run it over or running into any uh, uh, mess up your schedule that you have uh, planned ahead for uh, for today. So, um, again, thanks for coming out, um, being a part of the AMED Effect, and we can't wait to share your story. Um, and that, I think that's a wrap. <laughs> The causes and effects of Army Medical Opportunities are endless. When you join the U.S. Army Medical Department, not only will you get more out of your medical career, but you will also provide meaningful service to soldiers, their families, military retirees, and last but not least, your country. To learn more about AMED, visit GoArmy.com forward slash AMED. That's GoArmy.com forward slash AMED. And if you're looking for information on tuition assistance, visit GoArmy.com forward slash HPSP. That's GoArmy.com forward slash HPSP. 